Hello and welcome to China Econ Talk, a sub-China powered podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Schneider. Given the trade war, it's high time we turn back to a time when a trade war turned into, well, a real war. The first opium war from 1839 to 1842 was a clear turning point in Chinese history, exposing the weakness of the Qing dynasty and teaching foreigners that in relations with China, violence does pay. So how did this war come about and what can we learn from its origins? Today's guest is Stephen Platt, professor at UMass Amherst. He's the author of a number of thoroughly well-researched and honestly highly entertaining books about Qing-era China, the two most recent being Autumn and the Heavenly Kingdom, an account of the Taiping Civil War, and today's topic, his new book, Imperial Twilight, The Opium War and the End of China's Last Golden Age. Steve, thanks so much for coming on China Econ Talk. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Nice to be here. So we were speaking a little earlier before the episode, and you you mentioned that you your engagement with China actually started after you graduated. Could you talk a little about your first few years in China and what that experience was like? Oh wow, yeah. The first, I mean, that's I mean, clearly the fact that I'm a Chinese historian today shows that my life course was somewhat changed by that. Yeah, I had never given China a single thought before I before my senior year of college, um, and I found out about a uh, a teaching program there. Uh, the Yale China program, and went off after graduation. I'd been an English major. Went off to teach English at a middle school in Hunan province for two years. Hold up, hold up. So, so what did your parents think about this? <laughs> um, all right, here we get into sort of the legacy thing. But um, yeah, I mean, my, the original plan. I think I had been planning to go to to apply to law schools actually. Um, so yeah, I, I saw this pamphlet about Yale China. You know, they'd been sending teachers to China since like 1904 or something like that. Um, I was like, you know, how do I explain to my parents that I'm going to head off to China? But um, I called home, talked to my dad. Um, I said, there's this really nifty program, and they teach you the language and pay for your airfare and set you up in China, et cetera, et cetera. And he sort of listened to it for a little bit, and, and he said, you know, I think Uncle Bob did that. And it turned out that his uncle, so my great uncle, uh, Robert Platt, did yell China at exactly the same site in Changsha, um, in Hunan, um, in 1915. So he was there for Yuan Shikai's attempted coronation. So that, yeah, so there was a, there was a family connection there. So I, so I got the blessings of my parents and off I went. Would you mind dating yourself here? So what was your first year in China? I was there in 1993 to 1995. Um, so I arrived just at the point of Mao Zedong's 100th anniversary, the, the, um, what would have been his 100th birthday. And uh, those of you who have not been to Hunan, you know, Hunan is Mao country. Um, he, he was born and grew up outside of Changsha in a, in a semi-rural area out there. So Changsha, the capital of Hunan, was just decked out for Mao. Everything was pictures of Mao, you know, lighters that play the East is Red, um, calligraphy competitions to imitate him. Yeah, so that was the big news when I first got there. And like my my first day in the class, like every every new English teacher in China blows it on their first day. Mine was that there was a student in the back of the room who was sort of scribbling away at something during class, and yeah, you know, I was like, "Oh, so what are you what are you working on there?" And he said, "Oh, I'm writing a I'm writing a, an article for my school newspaper about how much I miss Chairman Mao," and and I thought, you know, this is a nice sort of English language teachable moment, and I said, "Well, actually, when you say that you miss something or somebody, it, it should be something that you know that you had or a person that you knew while they were alive. You know, you can say that you sort of you long for him or something, but but if you don't, you know, if you didn't know him." And you don't remember him. And, and he just stood up and started pounding his fists on the table. And he said, how dare you tell me not to miss my chairman? And yeah, I, can say, oh, I, I learned my lesson from that. But yeah, so I, so it was, you know, it was two years in the shadow of Mao Zedong um, and just an amazing time in China in terms of transformations. I mean, I've been back to the site there. Um, and, and I also had all the letters from my great uncle who was there in 1915. He had a much cushier life than I did. Um, you know, yeah, they had these beautiful Western style buildings and they had, you know, crates of macaroni being shipped in for their, you know, for them to eat and all, you know, they had tennis courts, things like that. Um, and, you know, we were in this sort of little cement, uh, building, which was the teacher's house at Yali Middle School. But, you know, this was sort of the, really one of the just 
transformative periods of China's rise when some people were getting incredibly rich and most people were incredibly poor. And, you know, just the the boom of little businesses and things being sold in the marketplace, the the booming resentment at the time of the people who, you know, were lording it over everyone else and, you know, flying around in their cars with special license plates. But it was, you know, it was a time when the students at the school were still very much being taught a socialist curriculum about, you know, Lei Feng and, and caring for the peasants and working for the people. And everything they saw outside of the school was capitalism and getting rich and just going through that. And furthermore, these students, their parents were all the cultural revolution generation. So they had parents who mostly hadn't been to school themselves and couldn't really guide them through this. Um, so, uh, so a lot of them sort of come to the American teachers and ask us, you know, what should we be doing? What should we be working for? What, you know, what's the point of this all? So it was, it was a very, very interesting time. You know, this period and, and a rather similar experience was captured really beautifully by Peter Hessler, I think. Yeah, I mean, he, he was in he was in sort of a village, you know, his river town, whatnot, whereas you know, Changsha was a it was a city of three million people. Um, it was a backwater. It was considered a small city by China standards. But um, still, it was a huge metro, metro, metropolis. And, and I mean, I, again, I mean, the last time I went back, you, know, you hear this cliche all the time about China, like, oh, if you go away and come back a year later, you won't recognize anything. And I've always thought of that as a cliche because I've always recognized things when I went back. And the last time I went back to Changsha a few years ago, like literally I did not recognize it anymore. So much of the city had been torn down and rebuilt. And I was like, wow, okay. So this has really happened now. Like this is just, I can't even like place where I am on the old map of the city. Um, it had just grown so much. There were plans to build the world's tallest building outside Changsha. Which, God you know, bless Changsha. Uh, unimaginable. Yeah. <laughs> So when I, I was I was there a few weeks ago and my distinct memory was um, uh, walking along the river and all of a sudden running into a Red Bull sponsored skateboard tournament uh, <laughs> blaring Chinese and American hip hop. Probably not the scene you would run into back in, um, uh, you know, 90, 94, 95. But, um, uh, you know, just to show that there is there's uh, there's 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 plenty of internationalization going on in, um, uh, no, I, in the heart of Hunan. I, I was still in the, I was still there in the era where, you know, some foreign teacher would discover that there was some store somewhere that that, you know, sold Ritz crackers. And we would like all descend on the store and buy their entire stock and like bring it home and hoard it for the rest of the year. I mean, we were we were carrying cheese up from Hong Kong, you know, all that all that kind of stuff that we tell the kids today who are going off to teach in China and they can't understand it old man. <laughs> so you transitioned from being an English major to a focus on a PhD in late Qing dynasty history. So what brought you to history in this era in particular? Um, oh, these are these are both great questions. Um, in terms of history as a discipline, um, I'd run my course with English. Um, I actually started English grad school when I came back um, from China and then dropped out. It, um, I mean, the thing that I loved about about being an English major was reading and, you know, in, in, in reading great works of literature. And when once it got to just sort of pure analysis and theory and stuff, then I got bored. History, I hadn't really studied at all. You know, I mean, I took the re required courses in high school. I took one course as an undergrad and really, I mean, I started reading Jonathan Spence's works when I was when I was in Changsha and had tons of reading time on my hands. And it was the uh, sort of the joy of reading something that read like literature, but was real and was teaching you something about the past. And just the fact that you, you know, you can do this. And, you know, I, as an English major, I'd sort of always dreamed of being a writer, but I knew I didn't really have it in me. Whereas being a historian, you, you don't have to make things up, which is the hard part about being a novelist. You don't have to, you know, invent characters and think about how to make them consistent that, you know, you're writing about people who lived at a certain time and there are sources on them that help you flesh them out. Um, so everything is, if you dig deep enough, you know, enough is there for you to write history in a narrative form, you know, with, with characters running around here and there without, without any of the uh, sort of, you know, running, you know, hitting the wall like you do when you're trying to write a short story and have no idea what happens next. My wife writes fiction and I'm always saying how, you know, how lucky she is that, that if she, you know, that she gets to just make stuff up. Um, and then she, you know, and then she tells me, well, you know, every time, you know, if you don't know what's going to happen next, you don't get writer's block. You just go to the library and find out what happened. <laughs> You know, that makes a lot of sense. I had a pretty similar experience spending a few months in Guilin last summer doing nothing but studying Chinese and reading Jonathan Spence's books. 
So is there any one book in particular that stuck to you over these years that you've kept coming back to of Jonathan Spence's? Wow, they all sort of blend into each other. But I do remember starting um, God's Chinese Son, uh, Jonathan Spence's Taiping book, um, and just being just blown away that this wasn't like any history book that I had read before. I mean, you know, he writes it sort of in the, uh, what is it in the, you know, he writes it in the present tense. It sort of is very immediate and literary. Um, and yeah, just as a way of just sort of bringing this world to life. I hadn't really seen anything like it before. I mean, it really, I mean, he's the reason I became a historian. I went, I, um, you know, after I dropped out of English grad school, I went and worked in New York for a little while, um, started applying to grad, to, to other kinds of grad school, um, East Asian studies and whatnot, and wound up going and going to Yale for a PhD in history with Jonathan Spence. And if he hadn't taken me and and sort of encouraged me, I don't know if I would have become a historian. I mean, he was sort of the historian that I wanted to study with. Um, I would have been just as happy going into like poli sci or Chinese literature or some other field um, with a different scholar. So it was, it was almost accidental in the end that I wound up, um, you know, becoming a historian of China. You asked about the Qing dynasty, like why why the Qing, and it's I mean it's really the nineteenth century and the early twentieth century that I'm most interested in. Um, partly because those are the eras where the uh, the engagement with the West matters so much, and I think as a, as a foreigner um, studying studying the history of China, the you know the things that have interested me are things that resonated with my own experience of being a foreigner in China. Um, and so the I, so I'm I'm very much interested in you know the characters of various foreigners who came to China and attempted to do different things. I'm very much interested in in sort of Chinese who who write about how to deal with foreigners or in foreign countries. I should say though that the uh, I mean it, all this stuff is sort of you know just one thing leads to another. There's no master plan. But the way I got into the Qing Dynasty specifically. Um, was my really my I mean my dissertation in grad school was on reformers and revolutionaries in Hunan province and I became interested in them because I had lived in Hunan and I was and I loved this province that I had lived in and it was always sort of looked down on as this backwater and as I was you know reading around looking for topics to do research on I was just amazed at how incredibly prominent the Hunanese were in the late 19th century um, really starting with the Taiping Rebellion, which is suppressed by Zheng Guofan, the great Hunanese general, um, leads into this you know, forgotten golden age for Hunan, where you know, there's one point where you know, most of the governor generals in the empire are Hunanese, and you know, other provinces are saying that they're being colonized by the Hunanese. Um, you know, most of the, you know, the lead, many of the leading reformers, and then later the leading revolutionaries, were all coming out of this same sort of ferment in this you know, supposedly backwater province. Um, and it all, and the book sort of culminated with the, uh, you know, around 1920, um, when Mao Zedong, you know, good old Mao, always, always there somewhere, was leading a Hunan independence movement. This is prior to becoming a communist, that he was trying to, you know, he was arguing for a Hunanese nation to establish itself as a republic. One of the lingering questions I had from that project was, well, why did the Hunan army win? Why was Zheng Guofan such an amazing general? What was it that he did? Um, you know, he's, he's this fascinating figure, this Confucian scholar who kind of gets dragged into warfare with no experience. And, you know, it ends up as you know one of the greatest generals of China's modern history. And I could only touch on him, you know, in a few pages in the uh, in the dissertation in my first book. So the the Taiping book that I wrote really began as wanting to find out more about Zhang Guofan, and then it expanded from there to include the foreigners who were who were taking sides in the war, and then it got bigger and bigger. Um, and then yeah, and then this Opium War book again, it's you know it's about British American Chinese relations um, in in an extremely formative era, which is a topic that I just find endlessly fascinating. You know, it's really interesting contrasting the Taiping Tianguo book to your Opium War one, in that the first work is a real blow by blow of the war, while. This Opium War book is almost a 50-year diplomatic history of the lead-up and spends very little time on the war itself. So what accounts for the difference in the focus between these two? Oh, that's a really good question. Because, um, I mean, some of that comes down to just the practicalities of being a historian. And, and you know, you're embarking on a project that's going to take years of research and writing before it can result in a book. 
And when the book comes out, you hope that there isn't another book just like it that you know, is already on the shelves or, or uh, yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, every historian is going to write about, you know, the same events in different ways. We have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of books on the U.S. Civil War that come out every year. And nobody seems to be complaining about that. In the Chinese studies field, people complain about that. And, and actually, when I started working on the typing, I had several people tell me, well, don't you know, Jonathan Spence already wrote a book about the typing rebellion? And yeah, you know, I just wanted to throttle them. There's this sort of this this narrowness sometimes that comes in that that or this belief that you know that people write these definitive books and then nobody else writes about it forever. I think graduate students are scared away from doing really big topics because there's already a book on that, and so they're encouraged to do something sort of more narrow and focused that just hasn't been done before. And you know, there's no better recipe for being bored with your work if you're only doing it because it hasn't been done. So you know, ideally, you want to find a topic that you love that also is a new a new take on something. But inevitably, you wind up sort of bouncing off of the books that do exist already. So when I was starting to work on the typing book, of course, I was aware that Jonathan Spence had written a book on the Taiping. But his book was very much about the origins of the Taiping Rebellion, and it was very much a biography of Hong Xiuquan, the leader. And if you look at my book on uh, my particular book, I went a completely different direction. There's very, very little about Hong Xiuquan in there, and there's very, very little about the origins of the Taiping. What, it, what I wrote about, since it hadn't been written about um, in any major way, was sort of the, the conduct of the war itself. And with my interest in Zhang Wafan and my interest in foreign relations, the period that really loomed largest was you know, the, the last four years or so of the war, um, which is the period where Zhang Wafan begins to matter. I mean, he doesn't even get to come in until maybe chapter seven or eight in the book, about a third of the way through. Um, so, I, I, so it's where Zhang Wafan and the Hunanese start to matter in this war, and it's where the foreigners start to really matter in the war. Um, and so then I had sort of a territory to work with that I didn't have a model for, and that's the, that's the real joy of, of, of working, this sort of the freedom to follow the parts of the topic that you want. But hundreds of people could come along and write books about that exact same era of the war, and they would all be able to find something different and new sources and new angles on it, and there should be the same same kind of vibrancy that we that we expect of like U.S. Civil War history, um, but it, it it we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so in terms of bouncing off the Opium War book, which I guess is what I'm supposed to be talking about here today, when you're starting a new project, there's sort of these twin tensions, one being the inertia of essentially trying to write a book that's like the book that you previously wrote because you're sort of in that mode of narrative writing. And, and so initially I, like, I wanted to write about the Opium War and I think, oh, well, I can just write a book about the Opium War and how it was fought and how the armies moved around and the ships and things like that. And you know, because that was that was how I had written a lot of the typing book. But then Julia Lovell was just uh, at that point publishing a book uh, which was a narrative history of the Opium War, sort of beginning to end, how the battles were fought, where the ships went, you know, who, who was fighting on either side. Um, so I and, and I looked at that and she did a good job with that. And I was like, well, I, you know, I don't need to really go over the same turf. So what is it that really interests me about this topic? And what is it where, where I think I can really sort of like, you know, dig my shovel into into some newer ground. And really, it was the the question of why it ever happened in the first place that drove the, that drove my book. And that started taking me back and back and back and back, and it wound up um, it wound up being a very different book from the typing book. In that the typing book basically took place all in the space of about four years, four or five years. Um, the Opium War book wound up, you know, covering something like fifty years. And uh, back to what I was saying about the sort of the twin tensions of starting a new project. Um, on the one hand, you have the inertia of wanting to continue in the same vein with similar kinds of sources, similar kind of narrative, because that's an easier transition. On the other hand, there's a part of you that wants to do something totally different. Um, and so this, so the research for the for the Opium War book and the writing of it were completely different. And um, and I'm, I'm glad you I'm, I'm glad you said you liked it. Um, when I was writing it, I was always, uh, it's it's a very different kind of a story to tell because it takes place over such a long period of time. And for one thing, the the characters in the Opium War book come and go fairly quickly. Nobody sticks around for long. There's only a few that are in there for for any really extended period of the book. Compared to writing about events that took place you know, over the course of four years, where your characters are all in play through the entire book unless they get killed, 
Um, so there's there's something uh, sort of tighter and easier to write about um, something like the Taiping Rebellion. Whereas working with this book, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think back to my English major days. Is it a picaresque where you're sort of going and this thing happens and that thing happens and this thing over here happens? And then you try to connect them all together. But it, it, it's more of that, that you know, stories come and go, events come and go, characters come and go, and you try to sort of thread it all together so it makes sense as a whole. Could you lay out the traditional historiography of the Opium War in the West and what brought you to question that narrative? Yeah, I mean... In, the main thing that I was grappling with here, because I was writing a book for general for a general audience for general readers, um, you know, one that one that will be readable to scholars, um, but ultimately the you know the not the straw men, but the the sort of the versions of opium more history that I really wanted to tackle are the ones more in the popular imagination, are the ones that stick in books that are you know often assigned for freshman classes in college or read by by you know, people who are just interested in history which is to say that you know that scholars have been chipping away from all different directions at the opium war there's an ocean of scholarship on the opium war but most of it lives exclusively in the scholarly realm and so the more general public understanding of the opium war as it appears sort of in the i mean in, in britain it seems to have been mostly forgotten except for julia lovell's book recently as it's generally understood by people who learn about it of course the british you know forced opium on the chinese and went to war in order to open the ports because that's what the british did um, so there's basically that sense of things that this is you know yet another of britain's you know imperial crimes this this horrible chapter of, of history and completely predictable because that's what the british were like okay and that falls apart on closer inspection, especially looking at the critics of the war, the political opposition to the war in Britain that no, the British were not universally gung-ho about, about forcing their will on everybody in sight. There is another version of it which shows up in a lot of the a lot of the older English language books on the Opium War, which still get read and still get assigned, which is this sort of genteel wink wink nudge nudge. Ah, this is the story, you know, triumph of the West. And you know, here are the British teaching a lesson to these, you know, arrogant Chinese who dare to call the British barbarians. And there's sort of this smugness that surrounds some of these books as well. Um, and in books like that, the Chinese characters always appear as the sort of long fingernailed Mandarin stuck in the past, you know, unable to speak complete sentences and, and you know, disparaging everything around them while being completely oblivious to the outside world. That also is a complete crock when you go back and look and look at the era that, you know, there were very sophisticated arguments about um, by Chinese scholars about how to handle foreign relations, how to deal with a British military threat. Um, the Chinese were not at all ignorant of, Brit of Britain's military power. The emperor was, he was all the way up in Beijing, but coastal officials, they'd been on British Navy ships, they'd seen them in action. They knew that this was a war that China should not enter and, and should not provoke. And just, I mean, and the basic smugness has to go out the window also, because this was a terrible, immoral war. And one of my fundamental questions here was, how did a society that at the time considered itself moral, you know, Britain had just abolished slavery a few years earlier and held itself up as this moral example for the world. How did it go from, from banning slavery and then suddenly turning around and fighting a war on behalf of drug dealers, which was essentially what this war was. So it seemed really paradoxical. And that's what I wanted to try to unravel is how this actually happened against, uh, you know, in light of the moral thought of the time and in light of the criticism that it received. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about sort of general understandings of the Opium War is that as understood in China, the Opium War is the predictable outcome of essentially you know, a, a, a British imperial master plan that the, the British had always been sharpening their knives um, and dreaming of carving up China and taking its riches. And here is where they finally got around to doing it. But in that, yet again falls apart on closer inspection, that there was nothing premeditated about this war. When you go back and you look at the era itself, the British government was actually remarkably consistent in avoiding any kind of violence towards China, avoiding conflict with them because they feared losing their tea trade. And periodically you would have British traders on the ground who try to gin up some excuse to send in gunships. And one after the other, they're shot down. They're shot down by the East India Company. They're shot down by parliament. They're shot down by the foreign secretary. 
And even Lord Palmerston, the foreign secretary that launches the opium war and prosecutes it, less than a year before the war broke out, he had issued clear instructions to his agent on the ground that any British subjects in China who should be punished for breaking the law, meaning smuggling opium, had to suffer their own consequences. And it was their responsibility for having chosen to violate the laws of China. And the British government would not help them. And then lo and behold, a year later, suddenly the British government is helping them. Whew, okay, that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so let's start by walking through the main themes and start with this misconception of the first British mission to the emperor of China. So a cute note, the British king writing a letter to the Qianlong emperor was, was trying to get into the head of what he expected this a uh, wizened oriental emperor would want to hear so came up with this great phraseology saying stuff like supreme emperor of china worthy to live tens and tens of thousands of years now god knows if that would be something that south korea or vietnam would send china's way but anyways what what struck out most to me about the beginning of the book was the general narrative of mccartney's visit is how the chinese aren't really interested in all at the british goods and their scientific advances so what actually was the response of the emperor to this delegation? All right. So, and yeah. So McCartney comes to, to the court of Chenlong just you know, in absolute awe of China, of its power, of its wealth, of its unity. Um, and, you know, this is, you know this, is, this is a classic moment because he doesn't get anything he wants. And then he goes away grumbling about how the whole place is going to collapse any day now. And it's this terrible country with a horrible leader. Um, so you have the sort of the disgruntlement of, of the British hoping for trade advantages. But one of the, one of the things that gets that become sort of eternalized from this um, is this notion that the that that China didn't care about foreign trade at all, and that it didn't care about foreigners, and it didn't you know blah blah blah. And you know there's a, there's this famous edict that that the that Ch the Qianlong Emperor addressed to the King of England, um, which is used in you know every every China survey course. I, I mean, it should be used in every China survey course, um, where he says you know we have no need for your manufacturer your manufacturers. We possess all things and da 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 da. That's always interpreted for some reason as, and I guess because of the British at the time interpreted it that way, as being as, as essentially boiling down, down to, we don't care about the things that you have. We don't care about the things that come through trade with the British. We know China is self-sufficient and doesn't need anything from beyond its own borders. That's not actually what that edict says. Um, in, in the context of, of the edict itself, what Chenlong is basically saying is we don't need more foreign trade than we already have. You know, we're, we are content with the way things work now. And when he says we have, you know, we possess all things, that's in the context of saying that foreigners have already come from all corners of the world to bring us their, their various manufacturers. We've seen all these things before. There's nothing that's new to us. So essentially there's this cosmopolitanism in there where they're already familiar with all of these products that the British are trying to awe them with. And they can get them through Canton. And you know, the, the emperor himself had a huge collection of English clocks. He had written poems about English products like glass. Um, he was very keenly interested himself. He had he had kept a, a European court painter to do oil paintings of him. So in the in the kerfuffle around this failed embassy, we get this long-lasting myth that up until the Opium War, nobody in China had any concern about the outside world, which is just wrong. There was a thriving trade at Canton, which was very important for the Chinese economy as a source of silver during a time of, of, a, of a rapidly growing population. The emperor was well aware of this, but the tone of his letter is basically, a lot of it is posturing, that it's you know, it would be unseemly for the emperor of China to say glowing things about faraway England, and in an edict like this, which has primarily a domestic audience, he needs to show that he's, he's not obsessed with foreign things. And I should say that this obsession with foreign things runs through the book as a as a debate amongst Chinese scholars about the value of foreign trade because foreign products are very popular in urban China in the early 19th century and a lot of money gets spent on them that certain scholars think is a waste of resources and those who want to shut down foreign trade it's largely because they see it as being wasteful um, that money that should be staying in the country is being spent instead on you know on, on fancy textiles or furs or especially you know glass prisms and clocks and in and, and eventually opium um, that could perfectly well come from china itself so there are a lot of contemporary parallels but the one that stuck out to me was this whole arc of the west souring on china 
you know, we go from Voltaire writing about how Confucian society is the world's most noble and a real counterexample to what he saw as the really depraved and amoral Catholic church. And But then we get writers in this era talking about the rotten corner of a globe ripe for the picking for British imperialism. So just over the past three years, this view among Chinese experts in the U.S. has really shifted in sort of the same ways. Yeah, and not just the, sort of the West's widely conceived, but really sort of the China experts. That I mean, it's one thing for the general public to have a certain opinion shaped by you know, newspapers and books and things like that. Um, it's another thing for people who are you know engaged somehow with China and spend their lives learning about it and studying it. And there are some some very important examples of this in the in the era leading up to the Opium War and in the Opium War itself. That the experts who in times when public opinion maybe looks down a bit on China, they're the ones who rise to the occasion to say, this is a country we should be engaged with. This is a great civilization. This is a place that we should respect. This is a place that, you know, in its system of laws is almost the equal of Europeans, you know, far superior to the Indians, as they as they would say back then. That they that they see their job as being to, to sort of hold China up and educate the public about how to respect it properly. Um, that when things start to go south, and especially when you know when the government in China or an official in China or an emperor in China um, acts in a way that they haven't predicted, they can become very vicious critics. They can become disillusioned very quickly, and then they become the they become sort of the point men in talking about the threat that China poses, or the, how terrible it is, or how it's going to fall apart. In this book, it was George Staunton who really played that role. But what you're saying about policy leaders in the past three or four years, yes, there's been a sea change in the China studies community in the United States going from sort of preaching engagement and, and, and opening, and we need to be patient and accommodating of China's rise, to a real bitterness that's been creeping in and a disillusionment and sort of you know, throwing hats on the ground and saying, this isn't a government we can really work with. So yeah, it's, it, these pendulums have swung, and it's especially to watch how the swing uh, relates to specifically the people who stake their careers on China and in, on interpreting it. You know, absolutely. So let's go back to the process by which over a couple of decades, tea goes from this rarefied prod product for the elite to a national staple, almost as important as something like salt or bread. So so what's up with tea? Um, tea is, a, you know, it becomes Britain's national drink. And, and you know, it, it, you get a little buzz of caffeine from it. It, it you know, it gives you a way of, of taking in more sugar, which is good for you. Um but the the issue about the china trade and the reason why it i mean the the reason why the china trade matters for the british is because you know up in this era china is the only place in the world they can get tea um and specifically canton is the only place in china where they are allowed to buy it they're not allowed to trade in other ports um, much of this is driven by tea. When McCartney went over on his mission, one of the hopes of the mission was that he would be able to bring back some tea plants and hopefully some like actual tea farmers from China, um, so they could experiment with trying to cultivate tea in other in other British territories. Um, that didn't work out. But as long as they were beholden to China for their tea. They wanted the trade to be open. And it's not just a matter of, you know, as the newspapers like to put it, gladdening the breakfast tables of England, but the fact that the East India Company has a monopoly on the China trade and the government in Great Britain taxes it very heavily for that privilege. So the tea that's imported to England from China at various times has 100% or more tax levied on it, which becomes a very substantial revenue stream for the British government, especially important during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century. Um, and so for that reason, indirectly, the British government has a vested interest in the stability and prosperity of the market at Canton, which is incidentally one of the reasons why they were so hands off of it. Um, even, you know, even McCartney in 1793 recognized that already the Royal Navy was powerful enough to bring China to its knees. Um, that already the, you know, the, the capabilities of the British Navy were so far superior to anything um, the Chinese had at the time, because China's power was on land, and especially you know, these wars fought out in Central Asia. Um, 
but as he wrote about it, you know, he said it would be so easy to just send in a few gunships and, and force China to its knees. He said, but if we did that, then the emperor would just shut down our access to tea. And then where would we be left? It would be a terrible blow to our economy. So it was this fear of losing tea um, that, that, that really kept the government intent on maintaining stability in China. Well, it's about high time we turn to drugs. So these merchants had a much more potent cargo than simply cotton. How did opium as a trade involved and how was it important to the UK and what was most importantly its societal impact on China? Yeah, I mean, the importance of opium for the UK was you know, very, very indirect that it ultimately became sort of a lubrication for the China market and a way of a way of getting the tea, which was taxed, which was a direct, you know, that was direct revenue for the British government. Opium itself, I mean, it had been around for a very long time. In, in terms of foreigners bringing it to China, there is a sequel to Robinson Crusoe um, set in 1719, where Robinson Crusoe has been rescued from his castaway island, and he's now shipping opium to Macau. Um, the East India Company has this... I mean, it's it's this fascinatingly perverse relationship with the opium trade, which is that they discover they can grow and produce it easily in the territory that they control in India, but they are afraid of carrying it to China and trying to sell it because it's illegal there, even if there's bribery in every direction, and people you know people are always calling me sort of de facto you know, you know sort of so-called illegal. Um, but in any case, so what the what the East India Company settles on is they produce opium under a monopoly in their territories of India, which is not all of India, um, but in British India. And then they sell it at auction at Calcutta to private merchants, British Par uh, and also Parsis from India, um, who then carry it to China and take the risk of finding a market for it in you know, outside Canton at the outlying islands or up and down the coast. Um, so by that means, the East India Company is going to make a huge amount of money from the sale of opium without actually carrying any of it to China by itself. And the East India Company merchants in Canton have absolutely nothing to do with this trade. That they're, they, you know, By the time the opium gets to China, it's in the hands of private merchants. The thing that happens, which makes opium into a serious problem. Um, so initially coming into the 19th century, um, it's coming in in limited supply. The East India Company has a vested interest in keeping it at a limited supply, which keeps the price very high. And the users of opium in China are wealthy people. It's an expensive foreign imported luxury good. Um, so wealthy urbanites, um, people at court, um, people who work in government offices, they are the primary users of opium. And back to the sort of the whole foreign goods thing, they prefer this opium from India because it's a foreign good. It's like buying, you know, like French champagne or something like that. Um, but, you know, the best, the, the most expensive kind has the stamp of approval of the East India Company. What goes haywire in that system in the early 19th century is that um, agricultural producers in other parts of India outside of the control of the British realize that they can get in on this trade just as easily. And so they start producing large amounts of opium in the free states of India, um, which the British can't control. And that gets shipped out of Bombay and carried over to China as a, as a rival kind of opium. They compete for market share, they compete on price, the price starts declining. Um, and the East India Company just wildly overreacts. Um, First, they try to corner the market by buying all of the opium from the free trading states, and then they just produce more. Finally, the East India Company throws up its hands and decides that they're going to produce as much as they possibly can to try to steal back market share. And the result of this, of course, is a flood of opium that by the, by the 1820s and into the 1830s starts going over and glutting the market in China, which again brings down the price allows usage to spread in China as this fashion for opium usage spreads downward to not just the extremely wealthy, but just the somewhat wealthy. It's important, though, to note that the, that the way we tend to think about opium in China is, um, is how it existed in the 20th century when you talked about you know, a staple like bread. It wouldn't be that until the 20th century. And at that point, you know, most of the opium was being produced in China itself, and it was incredibly cheap, and peasants could afford it, and you know, people in all walks of life. At the time of the Opium War, it was still expensive. It was still a luxury good. Common people weren't able to use it except you know, in very limited amounts. The two reasons why it was such a problem in the eyes of the government 
Um, one was that because I mean, it was a problem to the emperor because most of the people using it worked in government <laughs> and they were taking bribes and buying opium with it. So he was tied up with, with official corruption, which was a huge problem at, at that time for the Qing dynasty. Yeah, I mean, there was a um, uh, there, there was a great little anecdote you had in there of a uh, of a senior official um, writing a, uh, a, a a alarmist letter talking about how aspiring scholars during their um you know, three day civil service examination would be um, going through withdrawal while, while at the same time, you know, locked in their tiny rooms, writing their eight legged essays. Um, <laughs> yeah. I could not imagine a worse environment in which to be um, uh, to, to be trying to, you know, cut yourself off cold from uh, from something like this. Uh, yeah. No surprise. No surprise that some didn't some didn't make it out. But um, uh, sorry, back to your back to your second point. Especially because the students, you know, uh, you know, some of them took up smoking opium because they'd heard that it would sharpen their faculties and make them smarter. Um, but so yeah, so so uh, warning warning to all those um uh, all those uh, college kids out there are thinking about uh, playing around with Adderall. It doesn't <laughs> it doesn't end well, folks. It ends in war, is what happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So so there so for you know from the standpoint of the emperor. There is the visibility of opium because it's the elites in the capital and it's the you know, members of the imperial family and its officials and their underlings who are who are heavily involved in the trafficking and the in the smoking of opium that it becomes very present as, as a problem. The other reason that why it becomes why it becomes seen as a crisis is economic, um, which is that. Um, because the opium trade is illegal and it takes place along the coast and at outlying islands, it's not subject to the same rules that the normal trade at Canton was. And at Canton, the only silver that was allowed to be used in foreign trade was Spanish dollars. And I guess the reasoning was that they'd come from abroad, so it was okay to give them back to foreigners. Um, whereas the trade along the coast was largely, um, they were being paid with, with, with domestic Chinese silver which was not supposed to go out of the country and which was pouring into the hands of the opium merchants who then were just sending it back to England to be boiled down into bullion or melted down, I guess. Um, but it caused this drain of silver from the country. And the jury is still out on, whether, on how much of a role the opium trade actually played in the silver shortages that occurred in 1830s China, but there were silver shortages whether because of the opium trade, whether because of a global slump because of revolutions in Latin America that shut down mines, um, you know, whether, you know, you know, whether because of hoarding by wealthy people who saw the value going up. But the shortage of silver meant that the currency system um, in China got completely out of whack, um, which mattered mainly because um, peasants who conducted most of their lives in, this certain, in, in copper currency had to cough up a certain amount of silver when they paid their taxes annually. And as silver became more scarce in China, it became more and more expensive. And so effectively, the tax rates on peasants started skyrocketing, in some places doubling, um, for no apparent reason. Um, and the government, uh, you know, after canvassing officials and trying to figure this out, ultimately concluded that the real problem here is the opium trade and the fact that so much silver is going out of the country because of that. And that's what sends Lin Zexu to Canton. That is what ultimately causes the war, was the silver issue in China. You know, it's an interesting interaction. You can do all the hard regressions you want on silver's impact on the Chinese economy. But even if in the actual fact of the economy, the causation wasn't opium that led to the change in silver prices, the fact that the senior officials perceived it as such was what drove their actions at the time. Yeah, I mean, in Lin Zexu, the point man, the one, the, you know, the man who, who, who led the crackdown at Canton, the one who set his sights on the foreign opium dealers, you know, the reason for, for the war breaking out, He's, you know, he's remembered as this uncompromising enemy of opium and upstanding principled, you know, the uh, moralist. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is, I mean, I mean just a, a fascinating detail about him is that the first thing that he actually goes on record saying about opium um, is in 1833, a few, you know, several years before the Opium War. You know, by the time of the Opium War, he's very much he's a suppressionist. He wants to stamp out opium usage. Um, 1833, he writes to the emperor that if the problem is that so much silver is going out of the country because of the opium trade with foreigners, then the best solution to that would be that the Chinese Chinese should grow more opium themselves, <laughs> and then they would buy it from each other, and we wouldn't have silver going out of the country, and we wouldn't have an economic crisis. So that, of course, gets forgotten along the way about Lin Zexu. So there's a lot of misunderstandings, cross-cultural and otherwise, that go on in this story. So let's start with the British. 
What did they miss about Chinese society? Um, at the time of the war itself, the the biggest, most monstrous miss was that when Lin Zexu came and demanded that the British hand over their opium, and he sort of put the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the compound where the foreigners live under lock and key, um, those all of the merchants who had been in China for very long didn't expect anything really to come of this. You know, their trade might be shut down for a little while. It was frustrating. But they knew they weren't going to get their heads chopped off. Um, they knew they weren't going to be get stuck in some Chinese prison for the rest of their lives. Um, so they really, you know, they just sort of yawned and went, you know, and, and decided to wait things out, which is what they had done in the past, wait for things to blow over. The huge mis miscalculation that makes this war possible is that this man named Charles Elliot, who is the British superintendent of trade, who's arrived re uh, fairly recently, um, he gets it into his head that this is a very literal threat, and that if these British, and if the British subjects who he sees as being sort of under his protection, um, if they don't give up all of their opium, which is you know it's far away on various ships that have been sent off to Singapore and Manila and stuff, it's not actually like there on the ground in Canton to hand over. Um, it can't be seized by the Chinese authorities. Um, Elliot gets it into his head that if they don't bring back all of their opium and give it to Lin Zexu, that they are going to get their heads chopped off. And he acts on the basis of that, and he writes reports back to Palmerston so that the government in, in Britain thinks that these, that these threats are, are legitimate and therefore yeah, that their countrymen are under threat of death in China, and that constitutes grounds for a war of reprisal. Um, but the, I mean, really the thing that makes the whole war ultimately possible is, yeah, it's Charles Eliot totally misreading the situation. Um, finding, you know, finding a way to give all that opium to Lin Zexu. And the only way that he can do that, because he actually doesn't have any power over the British subjects at all. I mean, he, he really has no authority. So what he manages to do um, to get them to give their give up their opium is he buys it from them all. Um, in the name of Queen Victoria, he signs these promissory notes that they're going to be paid back by the British government for all of their property, and then collects it all and then hands it over and Lin Zexu destroys it. And that, more than anything, is what tips the government into military action in the end, um, because they are then on the hook for two million pounds worth of opium, which they owe to their own national drug dealers, um, and they ha who have a legitimate claim in British courts to this to this payback, and the government just doesn't have that money to give them. And so ultimately, at this very fateful cabinet meeting, they decide that since they don't have the money to pay back these merchants, they'll make China pay them back on the excuse that you know, Lin Zexu is threatening them. Yeah, it's cheaper to, what, start a war than, than bail out Lehman or something. It's really one hell of a, uh, a logical train that you see in this, uh, in this parliamentary debate and uh, uh, the, you know, these letters that, that Palmerston leaves us. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk a little bit about what you, what you think the, uh, the, the, the Chinese missed. Um, one, one thing that sort of struck me was this inability to understand British politics, which I guess makes a lot of sense because unlike the British, maybe they were off by 10 or 20%, but, but the Chinese, you know, have no one in running around Europe writing books about what's going on and, um, uh, you know, hanging out in Westminster understanding the, uh, the, the intricacies of parliamentary debate. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting some of the parallels where today you hear the Chinese government, you know, kind of complaining to, uh, to Western democracies, you know, why are we getting bad press? Why are your, uh, your companies not doing things in line with your, your national policies? This kind of expectation that, the, the foreign countries have the same type of power and influence over the entire society, um, you know, from a, from a commerce, from a media, from a, from a cultural perspective that the Chinese government do, does was an interesting parallel between modern PRC and, 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 and the Qing dynasty you were focusing on here. Yeah, I mean, I'd say one miscalculation on the Chinese side was not understanding what, the, you know, what free trade really meant. Um, that there was, uh, that Charles Eliot himself was quite opposed to the opium trade. But he had no power to do anything about it. He was just the superintendent. He didn't have any coercive power. Actually, the, you know, the, the government of Britain tried to arrange for him to be able to establish legal courts over the British subjects in China, and that was shot down by Parliament because it infringed on China's sovereignty and China's jurisdiction. Um, that you know that the British could not just go setting up a legal a law court in Chinese territory. That 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 was, that was unsound. Um, so as the as the officials that he was in contact with in Canton 
um, pressed him to do something to restrict the the opium traders, um, Elliot would just keep protesting like, I don't have that power. And with free traders, the government doesn't have that power either, that we can't, you know, that it's not, you know, it's not illegal under British law for them to be doing this. Um, we can't enforce your country's laws for them. Um, so, I mean, there were the loggerheads there where, the, you know, that he did ultimately find ways of cooperating, basically by turning people over, to, by threatening to turn people over to the Chinese authorities. But I think the bigger issue here, and it's, yeah, it's the, the imbalance of knowledge in the two different directions, which you, which you brought up, that the early 19th century is a period where you have the British for the first time really seriously trying to learn the language of China, trying to learn how the government operates, um, trying, you know, various um, explorers and missionaries trying to get into the country to find out what, you know, what, you know, what life is actually like, um, you know, really just, just trying to understand this other empire as much as they can. Um, whereas there is nothing in the other direction. You know, there's a few Chinese travelers who have gone off to Europe and, and left accounts. So th there isn't the same understanding of, of sort of how the how the British government operates. There is, however, a very good understanding of how British merchants operate because they've been working with them for so long, for generations. And I think the, I mean, one of the heartbreaking things about all this is what the Chinese did not miss which is um, that Lin Zexu, as he was on his way down to Canton, received advice from various scholars who understood the situation at Canton better than him. He'd never been there before. He didn't have any experience with foreigners. Um, and the officials who had had experience with foreigners, the scholars who, who were based in Canton, generally were the ones who were very wary of doing anything that would provoke um, or any kind of a violent military response from, from the British. And specifically, they were aware that shutting down trade could provoke a violent response. It had at times. You know, there, in 1834, um, there was an incident where gunships were called in because trade was shut down. That de-escalated before, before anything seriously happened, but not before those gunships blasted their way past China's very best coastal defenses with relative ease. So it isn't that the Chinese didn't realize what they were getting into. It's that various people warned Lin Zexu not to involve the, the British in his crackdown on opium, that it, he was supposed to do a domestic crackdown on domestic traffickers and users. And as people on both sides recognized, if the Chinese weren't buying opium, the British wouldn't be able to sell it. And there was nothing they could do about that. And there would be absolutely no grounds for a reprisal on Britain's side. But what Lin Zexu did and what he gets faulted for by his contemporaries um, and you know, by those who predicted outcomes like this ahead of time is that he doesn't just try to confiscate the opium. He also shuts down all British trade of every kind, um, ultimately for six weeks, a period of time when nobody knows when it's going to end. And that is what other Chinese scholars had said that might provoke them to anger and bring us you know, a war that we can't win. And that's ultimately what happened. So it's not that the Chinese, that sort of the Chinese generally were ignorant or miscalculated. It was that Lin Zexu specifically didn't listen to advice from people who might have, you know, where if he had taken their advice, things might have gone in a very different direction. Um, and one more thing that I would add, just I mean, in in trading terms, that you know, we we tend to think of the of the commerce with uh, between you know Britain and China by this point as being entirely about opium. Opium was a major part of the commerce, but it was separate from the above board commerce with selling textiles and things like that at Canton, which was also thriving at the time. Um, when Lin Zexu shut down the entire trade with Canton, so not just for the opium merchants, um, but you know, shiploads of British tecti textiles were waiting offshore, unable to unload their goods, that played an even greater role um, in starting the war than just sort of the confiscation of opium. The confiscation of opium created a financial problem for the British government. The shutting down of the regular trade, that brought into action the, the manufacturers back in England. Um, the, you know, the manu in the manufacturing districts in England, cities like Manchester and Leeds and Bristol, um, they became involved in a way that they never would have been involved in an opium issue. They washed their hands of the opium trade. They thought it was disgraceful. They had nothing to do with it, but they viewed China as a major outlet for their products. Um, so the, 
the merchants in Manchester alone um, sent a sent a petition to Palmerston saying that that year they were on track to oh I don't have the number handy but they were on the on track to sell something like seven or eight hundred thousand pounds worth of textiles to China, which would be unsellable as long as the trade was shut down. And so therefore they were pushing hard for the government in Great Britain to do something to reopen the normal trade, which brought in a huge political force. I mean, the, the, the political power of the manufacturing districts was you know, you know, magnitudes of order greater than, than that of these, these you know, paltry opium traders going back and forth from India to China. Um, and in terms of, and, and in financial terms, the fact that the textiles that were being sold just by Manchester were worth nearly the ha nearly half the value of all of the opium that had been seized and was destroyed um, also points to the fact that this wasn't just a trade in opium, that, they, that the, the British trade with China was much bigger than just that at the time. Um, and that there were other possible courses of outcome that would have reduced and hopefully eventually um, done away with the opium side of the trade while others, you know, other products came in to fill the gaps. You know, there are fascinating contemporary echoes in that debate, whether to work on the supply or demand side, just go for legalization or kill every open <laughs> user in China, sort of a la the Philippines model we're seeing today. <laughs> yeah, be happy with what you have. I mean, also, you know, the British, they go and fight this disgraceful and horrible and immoral war, and they don't really get much from it. I mean, you know, all of these wars against China to open up ports and these visions of how, you know, how rich everyone is going to get, they never really materialize. Um, you know, the, the firms, they never start making the money that they're expecting to get from sending in the gunships. So coming back now to corruption in the opium war, could you talk us through the impact that corrupt fi officials had in facilitating the trade? Yeah, this was, I mean, this was a period of terrible um, official corruption, which is sort of a legacy from the, from the 18th century and the you know, huge rise of the doubling of the Chinese population, whereas the government had to remain um, relatively small comparatively, um, making it harder and harder and harder to become an official, um, leading to all kinds of bribery schemes to get positions and you know, basically in debt, you have to make a yearly payment to the person who gave you your job. Um, so yeah, corruption was endemic. And the opium issue weaves directly into that because it's a fantastic means of income for corrupt officials. They're easily bribed to ignore any laws having to do with, with opium, opium smoking or opium smuggling. Um, there's very, very few instances of the government actually successfully cracking down on opium prior to the opium war. Um, that there would be sort of these half-hearted attempts, um, various, you know, various instances that are, that are trumpeted as great successes would turn out to actually have only confiscated a tiny amount of the drug. Um, but the, the, the paralysis that set in around this um, was, you know, it began with the Jiaqing Emperor um, after Qianlong um, with um, his, his punishment of He Shen, um, the, the, you know, the, the most corrupt minister in all of Chinese history, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I, I don't know, have you, have you seen the little thing going around the internet with the uh, New York Times op-ed penned by He Shen saying that he's part of the resistance in the Qianlong administration? Um, you know, I saw the one that said that if you wanted to see real court intrigue, you shouldn't waste your time with books like Bob Woodward's, but just read Qing Dynasty history. <laughs> How rotten exactly was the Chinese bureaucracy at the time? Um, all which is to say, so the, the emperor was faced with a bureaucracy that was corrupt at all levels. Um, and where you know, the people that, you know, the, the ministers who could be really properly trusted were few and far between. And it's a question of whether he should pursue an anti-corruption campaign, which as he worried would you know, either lead to the destruction of the entire government because everybody is complicit, or it would just lead to a settling of scores as people turned in others because nobody was really, you know, nobody, nobody was really immune to it. Nobody was not part of it in some way. Um, this matters with the discussions of opium policy because those who propose laws that target users of opium, um, sort of the, the, you know, the, the regular smokers of it or low level traffickers and couriers, um, that you know, some will propose harsh punishments for people like that. And then other government ministers argue that if we do have laws like that, that's just going to become another means for those local officials to oppress the, you know, the people under them. Um, that by threat of enforcing these laws, they're going to force even people who don't have anything to do with opium to give them even more bribes. Um, 
the bribery was rampant to the point that you know somebody like William Jardine, who's sort of the kingpin on the British side of the opium trade, this Scottish drug lord, um, could write to a friend back home that the opium trade in China is the most gentlemanlike speculation he's ever known, um, because he was very polite, because there was no enforcement of the laws at all, um, and so for the foreigners who were you know, who had, were in contact with the Chinese criminal guilds and, and merchants who were buying and selling their opium within China, um, it was a very sort of friendly process. We don't have examples of, you know, terrible violence going on or people being cheated or whatnot. It was just all of the officials had been bribed and so the opium was going to go where it was going to go. And I, I should say that Britain, which is on the most extremely thin ice, in trying to prosecute this war against China. One of the little threads that Palmerston holds on to in trying to justify why the British can go to war over these drug traffickers who have been breaking the law for so long, and he writes about this in a letter to the emperor, um, he said that you know because this law has basically been a dead letter all along that you've never you've never punished foreigners for for selling opium in China um, you know the, up until the opium war the you know the worst that a foreigner could possibly fear if they were caught um, doing anything short of murdering a Chinese person would be to get kicked out of the country and told not to come back. Um, so all of a sudden, Lin Zexu came to Canton saying that foreigners could be executed um, for, for, for selling opium. And in the eyes of Palmerston, that constituted an atrocity because those laws had never been enforced before. And then to suddenly sweep in and enforce them um, was, was something that was unreasonable and irrational and had to be, therefore Britain and China needed a proper treaty given, you know, stating the rights of the British in China. And that's, you know, that, that's how the war happens. Well, I guess, you know, we have, we do have tree line streets in, 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 uh, in Shanghai to think for this, but um, uh, you know, aside from that, for sure, it's um, uh, it's it's interesting how 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 small the return ends up um, uh, ends up really being given all the um, uh, all the uh, all the effort that went into it. I really want to now turn to some of your characters, which I think is, um, you know, a, a, a real fun part of the book. And it was clear that you you really enjoyed engaging with these people and and kind of following them on their China stories. Well, you don't have anyone who who thinks they're Jesus's son along the lines of the same time. There are there are certainly some characters ranging from a Brit who shows up and hangs out with the Dalai Lama, a la that um, uh Brad Pitt movie. We have really nerdy China scholars who who end up playing huge roles in uh, in international politics. We have a, a a single American hanging out in in Canton, who's the bell of the you know sweaty southern Chinese ball. There's there's just so much color in, in a book that's you know nominally about this high diplomatic relationship. So um, maybe maybe if you could talk a little bit about uh, some some of your favorites and. Um, uh, uh, the, the types of sources you were able to draw from and maybe some, you know, you know tales from the archives of, of finding out about these, you know, b b uh, ra rather, um, uh, you know, Xiao Jian uh, figures from history. Yeah, I mean, you, you brought up um, Thomas Manning, the one who goes and, and meets with the Dalai Lama. He almost didn't make it into the book because um, it was, yeah, it, it took me a while to figure out why he was necessary because um, he's just, I mean, he's wonderful in and of himself. He's this fascinating, eccentric character, who grows his beard down to his waist and, you know, uh, it manages to sneak himself into Tibet and goes and meets with the Dalai Lama. So he does represent more than just um, himself. But there, um, you, in terms of, of, of tracking his story, um, are the you wanted stories from the archives? I had actually writ, already written the chapter that he first appeared in. I'd written a draft of it. Um, based on these really fragmentary sources that are available about him, like very little is known about him. Um, he never really published anything. He was like viewed as this big scholar back in Britain, but he never published anything at all. Um, and it was sort of part of his eccentricity. But um, but pretty soon after that, I, I, I found out that the Royal Asiatic Society in London had just discovered the this trove of Thomas Manning's personal papers um, that had been just sort of, you know, sort of, you know, gathering dust in the proverbial, proverbial antiquarian bookstore. Um, but so, they had discovered these and they found them and they, they had just, you know, they'd just gone through and, cat and, and cataloged them. And so I was able to go and look at his original diaries from when he went up to, to, to Tibet and look at his letters home to his father and whatnot. It's just, um, there's, there's this wonderful confluence that happens when you have a character that you're interested in, 
who you hope can have a role in the book, and then you do manage to find sources that allow you to really work with them. Um, because sometimes you can't, and sometimes you can't make a character work, and they have to just be a one-dimensional person who pops in and then disappears, even if they play a major role. Um, Incidentally, that was a big issue with my typing book. Um, one thing that I don't think anyone has ever noticed, or at least nobody has ever told me that they noticed, um, that the two biggest characters in my typing book are Zhang Guofan on the one hand, the, the Hunan general, and Hong Rengan, the prime minister of the Taipings, who's really the character that the whole book hangs on. Like he's the beginning to end narrative. This is the story of Hong Rengan. Um, so the, the, the dirty secret from that book, I guess it's not so secret if you look at the notes, is that I was working with two main characters, one of whom, Zhang Guofan, you have just volumes and volumes of paper about him. Um, you know, they just published, uh, republished a new edition of his collected works, which was, which was, I don't know, 16 or 17 volumes, all of his letters home to his sons, all of his diaries, new versions of his diaries that have been expurgated in the past. Um, you can just go through day by day through his life and see what he's thinking, see, you know, like, what kind of tea he's drinking and how many games of Go he plays with his underlings, you know, all that detail to work with. For Hong Rangan, the Prime Minister of the Taiping, I had a small number of propaganda pamphlets that he put together, but for actual like detail on his life, all I had was, you know, three or four confessions that he wrote before he was executed, altogether totaling maybe 10 to 15 pages in Chinese. And so you put these on the scale and how can you make it work out? And that was one of the challenges of writing it um, was how to make both of these characters equally vivid when you have so much to work with for one and so little to work with for another. And it's just, it's a matter of pacing and bringing them in and out and making the most of what you actually have. So that was fun with Manning. Um, other characters, um, the, the nerdy China scholar you're referring to is probably George Staunton. Is that who you were thinking of? Yeah. Um, George Thomas Staunton, this sort of sad sack, repressed, um, you know, you know, wallflower of, of a man. Um, he's he's a fascinating character in and of his himself, and although he's not the main character of this book, he's the only character who lives from beginning to end and who ma and who matters from beginning to end. He's there all the way back at the time of the McCartney mission. He's along as a boy who he's, his father is the secretary to McCartney on that mission and he's McCartney's page. And so as a little boy, he gets to go to Beijing and he gets to sort of kneel in front of the Qianlong emperor. And he manages to be the only person on that entire embassy of everyone who came along with McCartney. He's the only one who learns any Chinese. And so he sort of trots out a few phrases and you know, pleases the, the Qianlong emperor. But that sets in course his whole life. Um, he winds up working for the East India Company. He becomes Britain's first real China scholar. Um, the thing is though, like he's totally uncompelling as a character. Um, he's sort of a heartbreaking figure. He, like, he's, he's a horrible public speaker. Um, he's very, very nervous. He doesn't really get along very well with other people. He doesn't seem to have very many friends. He's not what you would see as like a hero figure, but in the era running up to the Opium War, he almost emerges as a sort of a heroic figure. Um, he, by that point, he's back in England. He's got a seat in Parliament. Um, during the debates over, over removing the monopoly of the East India Company, he is the one who predicts that doing away with the East India Company monopoly and letting in you know, any Tom, Dick, or Harry with a ship into the China trade is going to lead to conflict and possibly even war. He's the one who says that. He's the one who knows it. He gets up in Parliament to make a speech about it, and he is such a horribly bad public speaker that nobody can understand what he's saying, and people just walk out, and eventually they cut off his speech because there is only about 40 people left in the entire chamber. Um, so that's poor, poor, poor Staunton. Um, and then I must say that even then, he still sort of maintains sort of this voice of conscience towards China, and then he just breaks your heart in two at the end of the book um, when you get to the actual opium war and he does exactly what he's not supposed to <laughs> and, and that's all there is to him you know given that this is the only chance i get to shout out napoleon on china econ talk i think i'd be remiss to giving up this opportunity there's a quote that napoleon gave at the very end of his life when he was uh, cooped up in saint helena to someone who was dropping by from his way uh, on his way from china back to the uk saying 
the worst thing you could have done for a number of years would be to go with the war, would be to go to war with an immense empire like China. You would doubtless first succeed, but you would teach them their own strength, and in the course of time, they would defeat you. You know, this whole idea of the dragon awakening is certainly bearing out today in Xi's China. I think. Absolutely. I mean that that resentment he warns his his British doctor about provoking in in the Chinese is absolutely something we are still feeling today. I mean, the memory of the Opium War is just foundational to Chinese nationalism. And as we see the expansion of the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea, you know, behind that is sort of a promise like we will never be bullied the way we were then. Thank Steve you Platt, so, much. so much. It's been really enjoyable, China, Jordan. If you're looking for more sub-China powered podcast action, this week I'd recommend you check out Tech Buzz China's hot take on the tech-enabled rental agencies in Beijing.